What's up, gamers? Welcome back to episode two, attempt two of Speedrun Watchback. I'm Spike Vegeta, and we're going to be talking all night about Super Mario Odyssey, my darker side PB from, I believe it was June of 2021, going over the middle third of the run. We're going to be talking about the 10 kingdoms below. I've already got them scored because this is a re-upload. The music was too loud, unfortunately, in that first upload. So we're going to be doing it again. I want to be able to go back and watch those and not be like, oh God, I can't hear my commentary. So let's put on the music this time. I tested it this time. A little bit of Super Mario Odyssey OST in the background. We should be good this time. Well, where we left off in episode one, we finished after the Snow One Seaside, the Snow One Seaside One group of kingdoms. We are almost to the end of the base uh, playthrough of the game, Saving Peach from uh, having to get married to Bowser and everything, that whole mess up on Moon Kingdom. We're going into the Luncheon Kingdom, and then today we'll be getting well into the post-game portion of the run. So let's go ahead and get it started, starting off with Luncheon 1. Luncheon, one of my absolute favorite kingdoms to do speedruns of. A lot of fun movement. Kicking off right here with the immediate backflip. Had a little bit of sloppiness right there. Unfortunately, I had to throw in that wall kick. Didn't mean to, but I apparently dropped the dive input. And now we're trying to get the spacing right here to get a full-on triple jump that actually cuts out a couple of wall kicks going up there on that timer challenge. So really nice stuff. Another one of those buffered spin pounds. Again, if you skipped episode one or you didn't catch that commentary, we're going to be wanting to do those buffered spin pounds basically whenever we can, whenever we have to go a little further distance than like one or two dives. We want to do that buffered spin pound so we can start our rolls at the top speed we can going for whatever distance we need to go for. You can buffer those out of like any load zone, out of any cut scene. As long as you can get two full rotations of the stick in that amount of time, you can do it. There we got the spirit fight. If you saw him back in the Wooded Kingdom, he's no different here. He's in a square arena or I guess a rectangular arena instead of a round arena. So yeah, overall this pace, I was feeling really happy about it. You know, obviously, as we went over yesterday, there were definitely some errors in the first hour of the run, but this was probably my best, one of my top two or three best first hours of this darker side run I ever had. I'm going to barely get to the Cheese Rocks Moon sub one hour, which is pretty good. Another nice buffered spin pound into a spin throw. Spin throws are optimal a lot of the time because they just go out a little further so you can throw Cappy a little sooner. Beautiful insta-capture movement right there. Being able to throw Cappy behind the pan, bro, and then have him move in, coming back towards Mario, behind the pan, bro, knocking off his hat and capturing him at the same time in one throw. Now making our way down, as I said, this, uh, this run ended up being, it was a 59.56 right there. Yeah, if you want to watch it just kind of standard with a timer and everything, and just like my candid comments and conversations uh, during the run, we did upload this about a week or so ago on the channel. You know, some chill lost music, love to listen to it. Dropping off the lava bubble. And this shut up, should set up my spacing to where I'll throw Cappy, dive onto him, which will give me a vaulted cap jump right there. A cap return jump. So we can make the rest of that distance. Here what you want to do is you want to get in another buffered spin pound so you can actually barely have good enough movement to cut that corner and catch that left lava bubble. Um, unfortunately, I got my uh, spin pound eaten right there, the roll out of it. So I had to take the other one, which does mess with the cycles, the rest of this room. But as you can see, as we're the lava bubble, you basically want to be doing that corkscrew spin jump as much as possible. Just moves you forward very fast as opposed to those slow, like big arc, uh, arcing jumps right there. Fun movement coming out of here, throwing out Cappy just so I can stall Mario push him a little further so then I can press R and ground pound at the same time, recentering the camera behind me and setting up my movement I wanted to do to get across those top pieces of the mountain right there. Make our way around, get the fork with some fun movement and capture the meat. That's right, that is meat with a mustache. I probably wouldn't need it. 
And now they give you like eight, 18 little platforms over there. You're supposed to jump and run across. We have Cappy. We're just going to jump, throw Cappy, dive on him and go over to the moon. Again, the design of a 3D Mario game is always super, super cool to me because they have to design it both for people who want to be a little creative with their platforming and be able to go really fast and just have good slick movement, but also so anyone could play the game. That's always what's cool about 3D Mario design. Now, that is the first half of the story here in Luncheon. Again, we pretty much want to bring peace to every kingdom in the run. Actually, every single one. Um, but I'm going to get a few more moons along the way before we make our way up to the final portion of the story of Luncheon. Up to Kukatil. And that's going to include warping up to this checkpoint. It's actually the only checkpoint that we got on the way up to that first multi-moon that you get to keep. Um... Again, whenever you progress the story in a given kingdom in Sumeria Odyssey, the kingdom gets put into different states where different moons are available or like different things are going on in the kingdom. And after you get that first multi-moon, it removes a bunch of the checkpoints and like puts up a bunch of walls and everything you've got. Right here, try to ground pound off the end of that little... Whatever vegetable that would be right there. I'm trying to think of what that is. I don't know. But regardless, nice movement getting up there. Another buffered spin pound. Stall myself out and then throw Cappy in order to cancel my roll and keep my speed going into the load zone right there. Now doing some more cork, uh, corkscrew spin jumps there with the lava bubble. Try to snag just the bottom of that moon so I need to rotate the camera down as I'm going into it. Another corkscrew to get over that long gap. And then the big jump. I think... I think you can do... <clears throat> excuse me. I do believe you can do a corkscrew to get to that torch. But it's a little tight. And if you mess it up, it's a little slow having to get a different lava bubble. So I just take the big jump right there. Pop out of it and then just stand in place. Now we get a really fun climb up here. But we got, we'll get one more moon first. We got to go over and use this fire piranha plant, this fire shooting piranha plant, to aim towards the two different torches. And right here, I make a little bit of a mistake. I hit it at the wrong angle. But you're getting to see that a thing that a lot of people don't know about this game is you can even hit fireballs with Cappy. And that'll actually speed it up getting over to the torch. Now we get this fun climb where I do a double jump, which gives me the perfect height to barely get over the top of that torch, throw Cappy to knock it out, and then set myself up for some triple jump spacing. Wall stall into the wall, throw Cappy, dive, extending Cappy over to the fork right there, and then do some nifty other movement, eventually ending into a backflip, up throw, grabbing the fork, up into the lava bubble, one corkscrew and a big jump there for perfect spacing to get into the cannon and up into the big pot to take out Kuka Teal. And whatever they're doing to lunch in Kingdom to make it not be at peace. I don't know. I didn't write the story of this game. But it's a Mario. We're not here for the story. We're here for the goddamn movement and the fun visuals. Now, right here with Kukatil, as I said, most bosses in this game have some way to, like, cancel their long invincibility attack. You do that here by punching him in the tank. Just jumping right up into it. It is random which side he goes to, so I kind of have to stop and see where he goes. Obviously, I would prefer him to go right here. Yep, yep. Pop him again. Now, those first two hits are pretty easy because you get a nice long stream to do the corkscrew jumps up. Here, you can't do that. If you do corkscrews, you're just going to fall down. And now I got to hope I don't get trolled, and I didn't. I always said with Kukatil that last hit is always very frustrating because it almost looks like there's an invisible wall that is kind of his beak that extends across and you have to barely get up over the top of that to get your last hit didn't get trolled i know my first time playing the game i i probably spent like five minutes trying to jump on that damn beak it was so hard but with that that's lunch in one again normally when i do these they're not going to be re-uploads and it's going to be you know I'm going to be figuring out on the fly. All right, what am I giving that out of five? And to know with the scores, sorry about that. To know with the scores, uh, whenever I do these, it's basically just going to be how easy or hard do I think it would be to save time if I did the split again? My overall emotional feeling towards that section of the run. And I would say Luncheon 1 was a five. They're like... 
two or three little sloppy pieces of movement here and there, but overall, I was very, very happy with that luncheon one. Again, you're getting a preview here. Bowser's 1 is shitty. Bowser's 2 was the second shittiest kingdom here. Um, overall, a very solid post game, but certainly a fair amount of slop. Um, but we got to start off strong here. Luncheon 1, a 5. Ruined one's going to get a five, although even it's going to have a little bit of sloppy movement, but it, there's not a lot going on in this one. I'll probably, out of the interest of just to save time on the VOD, we'll skip most of the Dragon Five, but I'll let you kind of get an idea for the basic idea, and then we'll jump to Bowser's. But yeah, here in Ruined One, only time we're, we're going to be coming here, so I'm actually going to take the time to get one additional moon, get this treasure chest on some nice movement there. And then I want to get a triple jump right here. I unfortunately got a one, two into a single instead. So I had to throw in a wall kick just to save myself. Um, if you do the triple jump, then you can do a little bit slicker, slightly faster movement to get up there. But overall, not a big deal. Probably the biggest thing worth pointing out in this boss fight right there, we just got, those are considered hint arts. As you can see, the Captain Toad is giving me 200 coins. Again, I need a thousand or so to, uh, I think it's actually exactly a thousand to make my route work for darker side, which is very easy to get. And that's a free 200 right there. From there at the end of each phase of the boss fight, we're just gonna try to take a damage boost, sit up there and get Cappy to start pulling the little lightning pegs out of his head as fast as I can to get that ground pound. From there, it's two more phases of that. Really not much worth pointing out, so I will actually just do a quick little skip ahead. Yeah, getting our multi-moon right there. And that's actually going to be it for the Ruined Kingdom. Again, gave it a 5 out of 5. Could have had slightly better movement, but it's not a kingdom. Like, I didn't die or anything. I didn't lose time on the dragon fight itself. So let's... Oop, went for a little too much there. Let's go into Bowser's Kingdom now, uh, where as you can see, I'll let you all know spoilers for all three episodes in this set. Uh, this is the worst split in the room. Um, there were definitely some parts that I do pretty well and you'll see throughout it, but there's some spots that cost me a lot of time, unfortunately. And I didn't think the run was gonna hit my sub three hour, 20 minute goal, but as it turns out, it's gonna get there, spoilers. Utilizing that spin throw right there to just extend Cappy as far as I can. And now going for a super cool strat. Another one of those up warps where I'm going to drop out of the Pokeo, throw Cappy, keep the Pokeo between Cappy and I, get the moon, start shaking the controller so it snaps to the Pokeo, snapping Mario up to the top into the triple jump dive, throwing Cappy into the pylon as we get there. Man, gotta make sure I grab this checkpoint specifically. I do want to use that for warping later in this episode, actually. And then I would say the first like kind of notable mistake right here. If you stall out your momentum just well enough as you're going by with that triple jump, the ogre will immediately slam down and then you can have nice slick movement to get on top of his head, get the ground pound, get the kill. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't. Nothing slick about it, so I had to do a slow backup. Making sure he's slammed into the ground. But that's it for the first story moon of Bowser's Kingdom. I always describe Bowser's Kingdom as it almost has like a Super Mario Galaxy feel to its level design. With each of the little mini planets. Then you go to the next one, the next one. The next, uh... Uh, the next plan here being for Story Moon, too bad being the Moon Shards. Nice snagging of that first one. Grab the second one as I'm going to the ground into the immediate backflip, rolling across. And then I, I was, it was a little unfortunate. The Pokios were split right there, and I couldn't gra grab either one of them. And I compounded with a little bit of sloppy movement right there. Didn't quite uh, snag the Moon Shards, so I had to drop back down. Still moving, though. Grab another Pokeo. Very nice capture right there. <laughs> I tried to get a little cheeky and kill the Pokeo behind me. That didn't cost me any time because I had to wait on the bomb anyways. Trying to get rid of them because genuinely you want to avoid damage in almost all cases in a Super Mario Odyssey speedrun. Damage boosts aren't nearly as, pos as uh, popular because, and you'll notice it, I'll try to point out the next time I take damage and then get a moon. Uh, the health refill takes like two and a half seconds. Not just the health refill, but then also it moving back up to the top right corner. Yeah, it's 
it's not good. So unless you can save at least two and a half seconds with the damage boost, it's not worth it. That pipe back there, very convenient for putting us right next to the story moon from those moon shards. Now here, I'm gonna try to go for a quick dive into a double jump, ground pound jump. One, two, ground pound jump right on the front there, making sure I land off the top of Cappy. It's a little piece, uh, uh, mechanic, tech, whatever you wanna call it, where if you throw Cappy and you immediately dive onto him, Basically, think of it as you bounce off of the bill of his cap and you actually don't go as high. Whereas if you throw Cappy and you slightly stall the dive, then you go off the top of the hat and actually gives you more height. That's a little trick to understand if you want to get into running Super Mario Odyssey. That if you're ever just like, man, I can't get the height, delay your diving onto Cappy. That fixes a lot of things. And right here, unfortunately, I'm a little too far back on the screen. I had to be a little further up because that kind of blocks me right here. You see, I walk slightly further down and then now I get to pop out. Now diving, moving on to the next island. And again, throughout the course of this run, we're, do we're getting a lot of specific moons because we're also uh, trying to make sure that we're routing in getting the correct Toadette achievement moons at the end of this run. She's going to make up like 31 or 32. I forget which one it is. Either 31 or 32 of our total 500 moons we need in order to get to Darker Side. Um, and a part of that is needing to get the uh, 40 checkpoints, actually. Uh, at least 40 checkpoints I can get that achievement moon from her. And I bring that up because we're in Bowser's Kingdom. A lot of these checkpoints are important because I'm actually going to use them to warp to them. They're not just a number. Really good Harriet fight right there. Um, a good beginner strat that you can do for it is let the bombs she throws land on the ground. Then you can stand over and knock them back at her. Whereas I'm trying to angle her throws and then jump midair and knock them back at her. I was able to hit all three of those. And now we get Topper. This is when you first start running the game. This guy's a bastard. Because right here, actually timing when you jump on his hat right there, all the hats need to be visible. Otherwise, you fall through him. And if I jump too late, like a quarter second later, then instead, I'm just going to take damage. He'll move out of the way. And you got to chase him down in an arena with like literally 20 hats in it. And uh, it's no fun. You lose a lot of time. It's not good. So again, this is going to end up being a two out of five kingdom. Up till now, this is like a four. Uh, there was like the ogre mishap at the beginning. This is like a four, not even like a dead on a five. A lot of stuff has gone well. I guess there was also the up warp on the Jizo, the, the, the shopping uh, planet back there. But now another buffered spin pound. Going to get some rolling in. Up, snag another checkpoint that we need later on for warping in Bowser's 2. Go over the top right here, and I want to position Cappy to where he blows out both of those top crates so there's just less for me to get around. And then we got to do some really fun blind movement right here. My blind, by fun, I mean movement that if I screw up, I die. Barely getting over those bombs, barely getting over that gap, and then getting in position right here for a very fun looking cat vault setup where I throw out Cappy, knowing right when the ogre's baited to slam down and then rolling into Cappy and start moving towards our next moon over here from Captain Toad while that other moon is spawning in. Very fun little section of routing right there. Also, you love to see Captain Toad. Look at that. Look at that good boy. He's so happy. Roll into a long jump into the immediate jump so I don't do any bonking or anything. And there's a nice little setup here to get the insta capture. The Pokio will always try to come to you in that corner. So you can just throw out Cappy and then shake to have him knock off the hat and capture the Pokio in one throw. Unfortunately, I mess up one of my motion controls right there. And then this kind of dumb thing happens. I am like slightly clipped into the wall right there. So I had to do that little jump to kind of get over what was clipped in. So lost a little bit more time here. Last checkpoint before we get up to the Mecha Brutal. But first, we got to drop down and get two more moons. Dropping down, blowing out these crates. I always have to kind of play it by ear where these, uh, these spinies are. And, uh, you know, some days I get that in one shot. 
Other days are like that where I had to poke at it about seven times before I could hit the hole. It's, it's tough. Sometimes man, you just can't find the hole. And that is what it is. Dropping down, getting the Bowser statue nose moon right there. And now we go up to definitely, I would say the hardest boss fight in the run uh, with the Mecha Brutal right here. The game wants you to use a Pokio to slowly knock those bombs back into his legs, knock him over, take out one of the four Brutal right here. Instead, as you can see, was a pretty cool movement. You can actually just get on top of the Brutal without the Pokio at all. I'm doing very specific, specific movement right there to bait the Mecha Brutal's face in the right direction so it doesn't get in the way. Unfortunately, I tried to ground pound there a little early, so I have to do a little bit of a different strat to get back. But each time, every time he knocks me back, every time the Mecha Brutal blows me back like that, you are refreshed with your ability to bounce off of Cappy. So that with a rainbow twirl mixed in the middle, I am trying to extend my movement as much as possible to just get up on top of the Mecha Brutal. Unfortunately right there, I didn't get down to this ledge grab position in time. So I'm having to do a slow backup where I let it jump five times or walk five times, then throw Cappy to try to get back. I don't quite get the jump I want right there. So I'm trying to extend as much as possible. I would have had the distance, but unfortunately the Mecha Brutal's face was just barely in the way, knocking me down. And I'm gonna lose about 25 seconds right here. This is probably the worst mistake in the entire run. It's compounded by the fact that I could not get Cappy to go towards the Pokio. And then right here, this can be the hardest thing when he starts moving around to hit Harriet up on top. I threw Cappy at that last one so I could stall myself at the perfect position so I knew where to ground pound. So that fight and like three of those other mistakes that you saw throughout that kingdom were where I was like, that's a pretty big time loss. So I gave it a two out of five. I, it's I can't imagine I will have another two in this entire run. Again, we'll see whenever I do the final episode. Um, but yeah, yeah, unfortunate. But that's how it goes, man. So at this point, I'm pretty neutral about this run and uh, I would need the post game to be pretty strong. The hard thing about doing the post game in a darker side run in Odyssey is once you're done with the story, there aren't a lot of like load screens and cut scenes and stuff that kind of slow down the pace. You pretty much just, you get a moon, you get a moon, you get a moon, you get another moon, you get four more moons over there, you get another moon over there. You go through a quick warp painting and you do it all again in the next kingdom. Last little bit of sloppy movement there in Bowser's 2. I'm trying to get like a double buffered spin pound going around the side, but that's pretty hard to space that out properly. And now just doing some movement to get around, do a little bit of slightly blind movement, get on the Odyssey and make my way over to the moon. For the last kingdom in the story segment of a uh, Super Mario Odyssey darker side. Now, obviously, the fun mechanic when you go on the moon uh, is that you have low gravity, very, very low gravity, enough to where you get to do fun strats like this with the one jump, the two jump, the triple jump into the vector falling, which makes you go a lot further. And now we have this bunny. I have a very specific spot that I roll to that baits the bunny to go right. I know he's going to go right. And I throw out Cappy at that point, catching him, stunning him, and then catching him on the ground as he lands to get my moon. A little bit more vector movement right there with the rock to get my second moon. And now going over to our third moon, I'm gonna be doing three rolls and then come out into a single jump, a double jump, and a triple jump into once again, this low gravity, beautiful vectoring. Could have went a little further with it, but not too bit, not too bad of a time loss there. Pick it up moon number three. We're gonna pick it up two more in this kingdom. Getting our rocket flower, having some nice fast movement here. Going to pick up another rocket flower. And as this one's running out, I'm going to let myself carry my P speed just a little further and then go into my triple jump that I will then curve around this corner into one of the most famous skips in Super Mario Odyssey speed running, the uh, moon cave skip right here by doing a ground pound, getting a lot of height off of that sphinx and then 
uh, wall kicking off of two very specific spots on the wall, making sure I don't lose any height or anything, I am able to completely skip the moon cave that you're supposed to go through here. And instead, we're basically going to go directly up to the chapel and face Bowser in the final boss fight. Nice low gravity movement right there, picking up our fourth moon off of that. And then just making sure I'm doing the quickest movements possible in order to gain a bunch of height, make my way up, and then ground pound all the way through that. Done with low gravity for moon one. Pop up over to the, sh the, uh, the, the rafters moon. And do one more buffered spin pound. Kind of shot over to the side, but Cappy got to the door in about the same amount of time, so I didn't really lose time there. And now we get the, the second Bowser fight. A lot of it's going to look pretty similar strategy-wise to the first one. Except this first hit, when the fight loads in, he's already throwing it back. So what I'm doing is, is I'm actually holding his hat back there, getting very close to Bowser, then calling it over to me so that he doesn't get a chance to try to run away and waste a bunch of time. He's got these big, scary-looking flames. It might look like I'm barely dodging them, but uh, if you look at the way the hitbox works for it, it's literally just a line scan. If you're not on the ground as the flame comes by, it ain't gonna hit you. See, once again, those cool strats where I'm instantly capturing the hat, uh, but with a backflip over the top of it, and right when it's underneath me, that's what I'm throwing, Cappy, to pop it up onto my head and start the attacks. Another round of skipping this. Again, it's just a line scan. I've seen people swag out where they do little roll skips over it as it comes by. Yeah. That's pretty surprising. Now here, once again, an intentional damage boost right here. Getting into position. Doing the backflip. Throwing Cappy right as it's underneath me. Capturing it. Jump over the one tail, the two tail, the three tail. Punch him a little bit more. One fake out and then punch him in the dick and you are done with Bowser fights for the run. Gotta jam out to the Super Mario Odyssey tunes. It's so good. Jump Up Superstar is such a fantastic track, dude. But here we are. This was one of my fi personal favorite parts. Uh, when I played the game casually, just getting to control Bowser right here. Very, very cool. Nice triple jump right there into the fireball. Uh, you're going to see me utilizing the fireballs whenever I need to hit anything that's long distance away. But once I get up to a pillar or a wall or whatever I have to blow up, uh, I start doing claw swipes overall a little faster DPS. Here going for the 2D shortcut right here, barely curving myself up. If you're a little off there, very easy to die with that jump. Always got to point out, there was actually a time save found, unironically like a year after Super Mario Odyssey came out, that was involved with uh, that 2D movement back there, where uh, obviously whenever you're Mario in a in a you know, a 2D Mario game, you hold Y, you run faster. No one had ever tried, at least in the speedrunning community, which is a few thousand people, no one had ever tried to hold Y as Bowser. Uh, but yeah, you save like two seconds just holding Y so you can run. We didn't know you could. Now you got the final pillars room, the final segment of an any percent run and where your blood is absolutely uh, bursting out of your veins. I don't know what I'm trying to say. You're nervous as hell where you're trying to get five hits on each of these pillars as fast as you can. How to do a quick turnaround right there. Obviously, like I said, trying to get in these fireballs, and then as soon as I get close, just go into the claw swipes. I left one health intentionally over here on this pillar. And then right there you saw I actually did a fireball I was in the as I was in the air. Because a little bit of movement tech, that actually suspends Bowser in the air very slightly by doing the fireball. And now jumping into it, the split for an 80% run to know it'll be in three, two, one, stop. That's your time. Rise, you blast out of that. For us, it's simply another split. We got a lot of run left to go. Well over half of it. But yeah, for me, it was a 128-19 Moon Kingdom right there. Um, 
probably, I think actually not too long ago, I actually did a run just for fun. I like doing this run still, even though I got my goal time. I like doing it here and there just because I find the run very fun. But uh, I think I got like a 128.10 for that split. So I believe this is my second best ever time going into the post game, even with that unfortunate mecha, uh, mecha brutal. But yeah, now we go into the post game, and now that we're done with most all the cutscenes and everything, this part of the run starts going really, really fast. It's gonna be a, about a moon every like 12 seconds or so on screen. Starting off here in Mushroom 1. Also to note, yeah, I gave myself a five out of five in Moon there. Really wasn't much at all that I would have been, that I would have uh, cared to improve of there. As you can see, this starts off with a four. Post game's a lot of fours. There's just a lot of potential for time save. Where you start off, you gotta get this seed, and then you gotta try to have really good P-speed movement while you're carrying it. Obviously, as you could imagine, seed movement can be pretty slow. Which, my movement, I was really happy with all that until this spot right here. I just could not get the seed with the right spacing into the pot. It was just unfortunate where it bounced. And then I didn't respond well to it. Right here, we got basically one more thing to do here in Mushroom 1 before we leave. Always make sure you talk to that toad. If you don't talk to that toad, then Peach does not spawn in any of the kingdoms the rest of the run. And, uh... That would only cost us like 14 moons or so. Yeah, that'd be bad. While that moon is spawning in, again, canonically, they're moons, not stars, they're moons. Look at that hint art. So a sp uh, moon can spawn in about an hour and 20 minutes from now in Cap Kingdom. Getting this Tanuki Tail Moon. And that will be the last thing we pick up here. At least that we need. We'll go through some regional coins here. And, uh, yeah, real quick, Mushroom 1. Yes, I gave myself a 4 there. Like, I absolutely could save time on that C not being stupid. But the rest of the movement, like, having good P-speed movement and triple jump movement up to that first throwing the seed into the pot is actually really hard to do. So I nailed the hard part and I screwed up the easy part. But now we go into snow too. As you saw, we went through our first warp painting there and we're gonna take this warp painting trail basically all the way through the post game, all the way back to Mushroom Kingdom. It's just nice because it cuts out um, anything of having to throw the moons onto the Odyssey or into the Odyssey. Um, until much later when it's one cut cutscene as opposed to like 12. Um, and when it cuts out the loading screens of getting to the kingdom, of flying between them, and it cuts out Cappy stopping you once you enter each kingdom being like, yo, there's a moon rock here. We should go check it out. Instead, you just pop right in and you get additional moons that you normally wouldn't really have access to unless you went through the warp paintings. Picking up a handful of moons right there, including talking to Captain Toad. Once again, best boy. Before we hit our first moon rock of the run, as you can see right here on this screen, hitting the moon rocks, those spawn in all those extra moons that just came up onto the map right there. Nice movement here for the timer challenge with the slick triple jump movement. And harder than that was the movement beforehand because as you'll see also right here, just having good optimal rolling on the hills because they're all so uneven and everything, especially here in Snow Kingdom, actually really hard to do. Very easy to fall off there down into the pond and you have to slowly climb back up and you lose a bunch of time. Getting a snow cheap cheap right here, which is a different capture from the cheap cheap. Another thing that we'll be keeping track of throughout the course of a darker side run is making sure that we get 35 captures different unique captures the t-rex the cheap cheap the snow cheap cheap so on and so forth uh so we can get uh the 35 capture toadette moon i believe she gives you one for 20 captures one for 35 and one for 45 we don't get the 45 but we get the 20 and the 35 picking up another timer challenge <coughs> excuse me picking up another timer challenge moon right there Try to get the triple jump, but once again, sometimes the hardest tricks in 3D Mario games are just trying to do a triple jump. 
you don't have quite the right amount of speed and the camera isn't angled right, the game doesn't give you the triple jump. So I had to slowly fall in the water and do some back and do a little bit of a backup. Best Peach here. I will take no further questions. Leggings Peach, she is the best. Cheers to that. We have Snow King. We have Snow Music in Snow Kingdom. I planned this soundtrack out for sure. And so now, for anyone who was wondering from episode one why we didn't go into all of these little side rooms that you normally have to go through in order to complete the story in Snow Kingdom, by waiting till now, that moon right there we just got, it was due to breaking the moon rock. And the moon rocks only are able to be broken after you bring peace to the kingdom of the corresponding kingdom. Um, so in this case, like finishing the Bound Bowl um, and having beaten Bowser in like, is, reach the credits, I should say. So getting out of the Moon Kingdom. Um, so now instead of getting those two moons and then coming back in to get that moon, they're consolidated to one trip. It would be enough to where it would not be worth it to come back into any of these rooms just for one moon. Just, we wouldn't get these moons. But now we can, and they're very fast additions. Nice movement there with that long jump getting up into this room. Doing a nice backflip into a dive. I got a little caught, lost my momentum. That kind of messes up this movement a little bit. Good, fast, slick movement there is very fun to watch. Where you basically just shoot up into the air and then you throw Cappy. It snags the peg, pulls it out, and you get to come back. You've got this lurker under the ice. This moon sucks. I always try to double tap it, and somehow, miraculously, it counted that. I... <laughs> I honestly kind of call it bullshit on the game. It should not have let, given me the moon there. Based on a lot of times where I ground pound that lurker and it doesn't give it to me, I've ground pounded it like in the middle of it and it doesn't give me the moon. It had mercy on me there. And it's good. Otherwise, I would have missed PB by like, or missed PB, missed sub 320 by like two seconds. You think about that, I got my goal time by three seconds. So like any other mistake over the course of this three hour, 20 minute run, uh, it doesn't sub 320. I don't know, I might come back and do more runs of this at some point, we'll see. But for now, I'm pretty happy with this time. I actually came up with the optimal movement here, particularly that backflip right there, skipping out on the middle, uh, little, little chomper dude, whatever you call him, and uh, getting up there in one less climb section. And nice movement there in general just to skip out of any of the slow, like, shimmying across the wall. I also didn't point out, so another added benefit of both of those last two rooms. Um, I'm actually here. I'll jump back ahead after this. But just to go over another benefit of the, uh, uh let me try to jump around. Eh, eh. So... That moon that's sitting right there, that moon is normally collected by defeating Rango in this ice arena. Rango doesn't exist. That is because since we did the snow clip in Snow Kingdom 1 and we already brought peace to the kingdom, the game thinks that we already beat Rango. Therefore, that moon is completely free, very fast to get, and I don't have to fight Rango. And that actually continues into this room that we did right afterwards, where normally that story moon that we got up at the top, it's tied to collecting five moon shards that would normally be all over this room in the lower area. The game thinks we already did that. We already got all five moon shards. So you get to save time making two other moons faster. So that, in addition to, you get these other fast moons that spawn in from the moon rock and everything. You get to skip out on the slow Goomba stack room. The snow clip is very powerful. All the cut scenes it cuts and everything. Yeah, very, very good. With that, though, I did want to make sure I rewound right there just to show y'all what's going on. Uh, kind of the added benefits of doing that snow clip from earlier. Now we get, and I get the nice 
chill vibes of seaside music. We're just about done with Snow Kingdom in the run. We just have to come back down here. I got to pick up two more quick moons and then two more on the outside. And we're going to take the warp into Cascade Kingdom. Dropping down, unfortunately, barely bounced off of like his hands right there. Because I'm trying to turn the camera as I fall down. So, because right there, those types of moons, I guess that's the first one you see of it in this run, um, are collected by talking to NPCs that have been captured by the Bonneteers, like Mario has with Cappy. Clearly, Cappy is an evil force. I don't know. <laughs> that's my that's Nukes's, that's my wife's uh, theory on it, for sure. Um, and a lot of YouTubers, I'm sure. They have the same theory. Um, but if their eyes are not on screen, you can't talk to them. So I have to make sure I go down there, cleanly stop right in front of them, and, and have the camera turned so I can talk to them at that time. Nice knocking the hat off into the up throw as I'm falling off to capture the Typhoon right here, or more commonly referred to as the Blowy Joey. Picking up another moon as we're moving by. Another up throw to capture him on time. So there is a skip for this called the Blowy Noe, where you do this like super glitchy wall kick and everything. Uh, over on the left side there, going up to this warp painting. Um, I've never really taken the time to learn it. I've had people teach it to me, but like, if you don't get it within about seven seconds, you don't actually save time. You, so you gotta get it within a few attempts. I instead just use the Blowy Joey to get that wall kick and uh, get up there instead. Going into Cascade 2, as you're going to see for most of the rest of the post game, of the post game, I gave Snow 2 a 4 out of 5 right there. Few little pieces of slop here and there to where I think it is an improvable split, um, but nothing major, I would say. Now utilizing the T-Rex right here, I got to do the same T-Rex bounce off this trampoline that we did way back in the beginning of the run, but your spacing has to be a little different. If you go back and look at the VOD right there, I made sure that I chomped through this rock that was right next to the T-Rex where he was sleeping so that I could get a moon later on, later in the kingdom. Now, bouncing up with the T-Rex, jumping up, hitting the moon rock, once again spawning a shitload more moons all over the kingdom. Talking to Captain Toad, best boy. See, we're going through the motions. And now, trying to bait that chain chomp properly to where he's sort of already fully extended and I have to barely move him into place. Buffered spin pound into the roll cancel right there. Long jump from a distance. <laughs> sliding barely over the edge there into that chimney. Now going for some fun triple jump movement, throwing Cappy, popping out the cloud platform right there. I need to land barely on these bricks, turn around, backflip, kick off the wall, lost a little bit of height, but we still barely made it work, barely by the hairs of Mario's chinny chin chin, and I move on to the rest of the movement. This room is particularly terrifying in a speed run because these clouds love to eat Cappy, and therefore you don't have Cappy to bounce off of. So you can see I'm trying to make sure I'm a good distance away from each of the cloud platforms as I'm going across here. Now, another great long jump into that chimney and moving on with the rest of the kingdom. Get on the front here, setting up the spacing for a backflip into a cat bounce into the moon, refreshing our cat bounce abilities and then rolling off here. We're going to try to get some small movement right here to get that double jump into a cap throw into a dive, simultaneously turning the cloud platform on and allowing for uh, Mario to dive onto that and continue his movement forward. That is a very, very scary moon right there. It takes a lot of practice, and uh, if you mess it up, you die, and you go all the way back to that last load zone. You lose a ton of time. I've definitely had many runs die here in Cascade 2. This one is alive, though, and it hits this absolutely... That is an impossible jump. I maybe get that in one out of every 10 runs. I'm definitely feeling myself right there that I was able to get that little crouch jump right into the little single block. Move into that 2D story moon, or 2D moon. And pick up the notes moon now. Long jump over. Carry my peace speed. Talk to Peach. Explorer outfit. And then we go into this moon. This moon is definitely another very frustrating moon in the Cascade Kingdom. 
where you get this chain chomp and I want to line it up on the wall with a specific visual cue and then pop him back. It's very precise where you have to pop him from for him to fully extend to that rock to break open the moon. And it's, I would say for me, it's about a 50-50 sometimes if it works. Was able to get it second try, but missing it once probably costs you, I would guess, six or seven seconds. So unfortunately with that alone and having to miss the T-Rex bounce, this, I would say this can kind of max at a four. It's still a good kingdom. And now going for that same basic mechanic in the game where every time you get a moon, that refills your ability to get a Cappy Bounce. Allowing me to get back up there as scary as that looks dropping down. Didn't quite get, once again, triple jumps. They're hard in 3D Mario games. Was able to get it there. Did a little backflip back up to get over the first set. Going over, long jumping. Long jumping out of your rolls is a pretty good way to get just that little bit of height without having to like stop your roll or anything. And making sure I space my skips in the roll form to kind of go over little mini ledges. Triple jump, this is the moon I was talking about where I had to have the T-Rex when I first captured him break that rock so that when Mario comes back, he could get the moon and capture the T-Rex all in one go. Now we got another rock moon where I am just going to have the T-Rex drop on the thing, one-shotting it, and then just eating the moon, completely shoving my head into the wall right there. Now coming over here, we need the T-Rex for one more thing. We need him to destroy this little electrical pole. And unfortunately, I, I pretty much broke everything but the electrical pole. I made a circle around the damn thing. Popping out, riding that power line up just a little bit to kind of get around all those... Uh, those ribs and everything, so I could get that moon, which was the hint art we got from Lake One back very early on in this run. Our second tourist moon right there, we first talked to him in Metro, now we get him here in Cascade. And the other three moons we get from him, they will all be in episode three, all pretty close to each other near the end of the run. Pick up a pretty easy moon back there and then get to talk to the shop moon. Yeah, we, get, we end up getting, I believe, eight shop moons throughout the course of my route in Darker Side. Um, they're generally fast enough if we don't have to go through, like, extra load zones to get to them. And these are outside, so they're pretty quick. Once again, very specific movement for this bunny right here. If you're going to get into running Super Mario Odyssey, especially one of these post-game categories, Darker Side, All Moons, even Dark Side or anything, the first thing I would say to learn in addition to the any percent strats is make sure you know your bunny strats. Bunnies, fish, and birds, they waste all the time in these runs. Intentionally bonking into the chest right there to just get the moon spawned in as quickly as possible. Cause you gotta wait for the moon to spawn in a little bit anyway. So it's not faster for me to like ground pound on top of it, like stopping or anything. Just get the moon spawned and then you can get out of the, uh, the stun animation and get it. Got my last couple of moons there. Had some slop there with the timer challenge. I would say I would stand by Cascade 2 as a four. There were definitely a lot of things that could have went very wrong. But as you can see, there were four or five spots where I lost a notable amount of time where I could go back and get a five for sure. But I stand by that being a four. Here into Bowser's two. You see, the second worst split of the day. Try to remember what all goes wrong. We'll find out, I guess. Doing some nice movement there to break open the moon rock once again. You can see for the most part here in the post game, the first thing we want to do is go hit the moon rock. Because a lot of the post game routing you're getting some moons that are in the game without the moon rock, but you're also getting the moon rock moons along the way as well. So it's just fast moon, fast moon, fast moon. You see it right here, just got that crate moon. And now we're going to pop out of the water to go to the other side. But I actually want to drop down on the side a lot before I actually go into the water. 
water, very slow to descend, as opposed to falling through the air much, much faster, and then I can dive through going straight to the moon. Super fun movement we get to do right here where I buffer a spin pound, pick up a lot of speed, roll once past that corner, then triple jump with some vectoring, throw Cappy into the wall, barely make that distance, skipping out on an entire extra section you have to run through that flicks you over to that area for that moon. Get into position, knock down the painting, pick up another moon. See, I don't have to do much skipping ahead, honestly, in post-game. <laughs> little bit of sloppy movement. I just couldn't, I, I didn't get my dive because I was a little too close to the ground. Once again, almost every kingdom has a bunny in it. Stunning him with the cap throw right at the last second and then popping him. Rise we get on top there into the cap dive, triple jump, get in position, angle the camera to where I know if I hold forward, I will go the distance. The great song from Hercules. So when I spin pound, I'm going to go straight the direction I want to go. Buffer another spin pound as we're coming out of that landing. And then right here, I'm trying to buffer a spin pound as I'm going over that bird spot for this moon. Unfortunately, I didn't quite buffer correctly. I skipped one too far forward and I had to come back and I even missed a ground pound on top of that. It's a pretty small spot you're trying to actually ground pound on. So a little understandable there. Backflip into the immediate ledge grab. Some nice movement in that timer challenge to get up there very quickly. Still have the platform up there that I can do another spin pound off of. And you do that impossible blind movement right there. Very difficult. I really like this sub area in the speed run because if you look out in the distance there, there's all these things going on on the left and right side with all those platforms. It's supposed to be this big like puzzle room. Instead, we are once again going to utilize the fact that we have Cappy and we can bounce off of him. We get a lot of height with a triple jump. We just go up to that moon and then we do a super cheeky little spin jump up, kick off the wall and get the other moon. So this room that probably casually took like three, four minutes, we do in about 20 seconds. Pretty cool. Back here to the shop area. Unfortunately, didn't get my spin pound again, so I just did a ground pound instead. Got over to Peach. A lot of people say this is best Peach. She's still great. Kimono Peach. Very cute. But again, leggings Peach, man. You can't beat that. Stop it in this shop as well. The routing kind of works out, even though technically this adds... Uh, it would add two load zones uh, going in to get this shop moon. Because I need to warp out of this area anyways... It effectively just combines the two load zones. So it's really just one, and I don't even have to open a door or anything. You just go straight in. Bowser's 2 is quickly coming to a close here. As we go over, snag this quick moon. And now we go into, I would say this is probably the worst part of my Bowser's 2. Is unfortunately... My motion controls were very slightly off. The only good thing I can say about this is I didn't take damage somehow. I did actually some pretty sick dodging of some of the spinies there. But yeah, I got an up throw instead of a throwing forward. And that just... I love the motion controls in this game, but I also some days really hate them. And that was just a little unfortunate right there. Picking up another glory hole moon here with the Pokeo. And then it is possible to do some really sexy movement with the notes right here. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. Yeah, I somehow just completely whiffed where I was going to go. So I had to do some sort of like weird backup movement, I guess. Basically, if I do that correctly, then I go over and like in one flick up, I get every, I get every note. This Bowser's 2 ends up being a 3, kind of by death by a million paper cuts. Right there, once again, I just couldn't get my buffered spin pounds going. This did sort of work out, though, in that I got really good RNG from that bird. The bird can look in any direction it wants. So if it's looking at you when you throw Cappy, it'll just run away. 
Thankfully, it was looking away, so I was able to stop it right there, and I didn't have to do a slower back up, back up to uh, to get the the moon from the bird. Pick it up, another moon right there, and then we got one more moon, and we're already almost done with Bowser's two. Going up for the triple jump, Cappy bounce into the dive. Cork screwing into another buffered spin pound right there, getting the second hit immediately. I think they want you to like stack up a bunch of Goombas and then jump above him. Nah, once again, it feels so good in a 3D Mario game when you know how to give yourself a lot of verticality with just the basic mechanics the game gives you. Like these aren't game breaking glitches or anything. These are mechanics built into the game. It's very fun. It's also bullshit that I didn't bonk there going around that corner. I 100%. Should have bonked on that wall. But I digress. Bowser's 2. I'm giving it a 3 out of 5. Death by a million paper cuts. And now we go into Seaside 2. Unfortunately, was a little off on my spacing there. Bonked into the chest. Making my way down. Skipping over the volleyball moons back there. Believe it or not, 100 volleyball spikes is not fast enough to be in darker side. Cool movement right here where I do a buffered spin pound, throw Cappy, make him home into the plant, do the little double tap bounce off of the robot right there, which suspends me out just long enough to make sure the moon spawns in and then dive into it. Whiffed on the moon in the air, I barely somehow magically dove over it. I think that's the game doing a makeup call because I didn't bonk in Bowser's Kingdom back there. So I had to bounce off of the... Uh, Little umbrella right there so I can get the moon. Shout out to Super Mario 64 and the Jolly Roger Bay Cave Star. What this moon was based off of. Paying homage. Nearly 21 years later. And now warping over to the lighthouse. The first of two times that we actually load over here. Immediate backflip. Change directions with the cap throw. Pick up another moon right here. And so something that you'll see here a couple times, a number of times in this run is that we're also going to want those bird moons. So every time you either warp to a load zone or you just come out of a, a checkpoint or anything, the birds of a given kingdom will be in a very set starting position. So I knew from the time I warped up to the lighthouse to the time I flew up in the air, if I had clean movement, that is where that bird was going to be. So we get to utilize strats like that for really interesting routing all over uh, these kind of post-game categories. Again, darker side, all moons, dark side, all of them, 100%. And utilizing that gushing to quickly fly around the kingdom, pick up a couple of moons, drop down for another outdoor shop moon. And then making sure I'm close enough there to where a throwing of Cappy with a extension on shaking the controller was able to get to the cheap cheap. Cheap cheap, really hard not to bonk right there. I bonk basically every time. Now we're just swimming through. Again, Seaside, it has a lot of cool stuff in it, but it also has stretches where you're just kind of swimming around, picking up some easy moons here and there. Picking up another free checkpoint. Not going to utilize that for warping or anything. Again, I just need 40 for the Toadette achievements. That light blue moon right there is for the uh, hint art we saw for it back in Luncheon Kingdom. Back in actually the first split of today's episode. Cute little strat right here where I throw Cappy onto the little pillar right there and then I get between or I make sure the cheap cheap is between Mario and Cappy so it almost like boomerang effect comes back snaps that cheap cheap which is a little closer and I can get up to the moon faster and move on with the kingdom talking to Dory getting another quick moon right there and uh, one thing you're seeing a lot of people probably didn't know this casually the cheap, cheap spin attack right there, the little shake spin, that is the same properties as a Mario ground pound. So probably a lot of people, when you did these moons, you did a ground pound. Yeah, those are slow. We don't want them. Also talking about the fish clip right here, where basically what's happening is I'm putting the cheap, cheap as far out of bounds as it will let me, then I decapture from it because the game is supposed to not let you go out there, obviously. 
by decapturing with Mario, the game is making sure Mario isn't going out of bounds. It doesn't care about that cheap cheap. So then I go a little distance away, making sure that it's like little protection stops paying attention to you. It says, okay, the player's back in bounds, we're fine. Then I recapture the cheap cheap as it's out of bounds and I go that little extra distance and we're able to get out. It's pretty cool stuff. What's not cool is this jump. It makes me piss my pants every time. These uh, little surfaces, they are very much curved. So if you don't land right in the front of that first one I jumped on, it will you will fall off and you have to do a really slow backup later on. Unfortunately, with the gliding right there, you were able to kind of showcase that moons. I always, I, 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 I played Magic the Gathering as a kid. I always say this about moons. They basically have summoning sickness. When they are first on screen, they don't actually exist. Not for the first, like, second or so they're there. So, I spawned the bunny moon in, but I dove through them with Glidon before it was fully spawned in, and then I had to turn around to get it. And what sucks about that is you normally say, ah, eh, it was like a second or two. That combined with me not being able to get this little crouch speed underneath that little spot meant I missed actually an entire platform cycle with this platform right here that I'm on. So lost a good amount of time for that, unfortunately. I think that's going to be kind of what makes Seaside 2 a four instead of a five. So I think the rest of this kingdom was like pretty solid. We got this 2D movement right here, which just, unfortunately, I, I don't know what good movement looks like in this 8-bit area. You kind of go around. I accept, like most runners do, I accept taking a piece of damage on that red Koopa up top. And then I try to just make sure I don't take any more damage besides that. I would say that notes movement, like that it was able to get a lot of those notes on the bottom section for me. I got pretty much everything up top, collected everything else. I think it was pretty solid movement besides that. Besides the, uh, I should say, that section of the 2D section, that's actually pretty good for me. And I've really never seen that section look like super good. It's awkward for sure. It is worth noting that right there, a newer skip was found a few months after I got this PD called, I forget if they call it like the fish and dip or whatever, but you're basically able to use that treasure chest moon back there to clip out of bounds, recollect the treasure chest moon, get that moon that I just got, and then stay out of bounds all the way up to this next moon I collect. Unfortunately, I got some rough RNG right there where that wiggly enemy was barely in the way. So took damage because it's completely random where they're going to be. And I wanted to have top down movement because if I manipulate the camera properly, I can get in, get that moon and get out without that eel popping out and biting me and wasting that two and a half seconds. So you kind of, if you go back and look at the VOD right there, whether it be in my PB or just this video right here, you see how slow it can be when, after I get a moon, it refills the health and then the health has to move back to the top right of the screen. Again, about a two and a half second time loss each time. If I do that blind movement perfectly and don't bonk or anything going in and coming out, that's actually a pretty good time save. And probably the biggest reason why the fishing dip would be a really good skip to learn. I put a few hours into learning it. I don't have a good grasp on it yet. But if we go back to darker side runs, I could definitely see myself trying to implement it into my runs. And with that, we are out of seaside. Again, a lot of it was good. The uh, I don't fault it too much because genuinely that camera movement at the end is very difficult. And the only other notable thing was definitely the missing of the platform cycle in the 8-bit section. So I think a 4 out of 5 is actually pretty fair for that. Super cool movement right there where I do that buffered spin pound into the nut, busting it. That's right, big nut. And then getting the ground pound jump, vaulting me most of the way through the moon vertically so that I could immediately wall stall, kick off the wall, and get up on top of that platform and make my way over to the rest of the story. So again, throughout the course of this run, I 
The goal was to bring peace to every single kingdom. It just, the routing works out best to have peace in every kingdom. You get a lot more moons available to you and it gives you the fastest route. Um, this was the only kingdom wooded where I didn't finish the story the first time we played through the game. That's simply because if I had done it from the time I beat Spewart, it spawns you back to the Odyssey and I have to climb all the way back up. Whereas if I waited till the post game, when I'm coming through the warp painting, I'm already like halfway up the climb. So it actually saves a lot of time. Now we go into the Torque Drift boss fight. Where there's, I would say out of every boss of the game, this has the least amount of, amount of like tech to it. The biggest thing is just breaking each of these like little flower orbs as quickly as you can. You'll see like, sometimes I'll try to like stop them in place as they're moving by timing when I like, grow up into the bottom of them when I extend up into the bottom of them. But other than that, a lot of people wonder like, oh, can you like, you know, get on top of him and then ground pound him? You actually just take damage. He's invulnerable when he's up there. So for a game that overall, you can kind of see right here, I'm going to catch it as it's moving. And then that stuns him to where you can get the last hit. For a game that overall is built around, there's always ways to speed up the boss fights. This is really the only one in the entire game where there's no real way to do that. So I'll skip over the last phase of this. There's not really anything else to talk about in uh, the Torque Drift fight, but he's done. It's kind of a chill little breather about two thirds of the way into the run. Again, this is the last split of the day we're talking about before the finale. I'll try to knock out sometime this weekend. Um, get it uploaded early next week. But um, yeah, at this point, like this post game has been solid for sure. I don't think it's an amazing post game, but I think it's pretty solid. Once again, very specific bunny movement I'm doing right there. Long jumping out and making sure I'm on this perfect line, rolling to the right side of that tree. I basically want to hug the tree as much as I can without obviously actually bonking into it. And that'll get, that allow me to be at top speed to roll directly into the bunny and then come back. And then another instance, I guess, yeah, that's the second time along with Moon Kingdom where if you take the rock that has the moon in it and you just push it into another rock, that breaks the moon rock immediately and you get it. Speaking of moon rocks, here's a moon rock. Blowing it up, getting a lot more moons spawned in. Now we gotta make our way over to, not a moon, but a hint art to spawn a moon in Sand King later on. Unfortunately, I didn't have good movement there, bonked onto the tree. A little hard to perfectly kind of shoot into that bottom part of the tree, but. Look at the hint art that spawns in another moon in Sand Kingdom we will pick up in episode three. And now, warping up, getting to move around, Find a lot more moons. And uh, a theme of this is we're just going to be absolutely busting those Good. all over the place. I think there's unironically like 14 nut moons in Wooded. And I, there might be like one I can think of we don't Good. <laughs> bust. Utilizing the tank right there. So I could break open that wall, which has a moon in it, and breaking that crate up in the tree. And then conveniently moving up here, both of them get to spawn like right next to each other. It's unfortunate that one little chicken nugget of a piece of the wall right there was in the way. Messed with my movement, both getting into that moon's hole and coming out of it. This is one of my absolute favorite strats in the entire run. Unfortunately, I don't quite get the jump over the railing. So I have to come back down, pick up two more rocket flowers, see if I can space it correctly. This time was able to. And now with some super cool vectoring, we gain a ton of speed going all the way down to this Captain Toad moon. Picking up the moon. And what's extra cool about this strat is it breaks the sequence of how you were supposed to get over here. That pipe was how you're supposed to get back up to the observation deck, utilizing glide on right there to fly out to Toad. Normally there's a very slow sequence where you pick up another, 
uh, just like that, nut. and bring it over to. Uh, oh, I guess you don't need the nut necessarily, but it's some very slow like platforms you have to ride on and everything. And instead, that just circumvents that whole nut. section of the run, or that section of the the kingdom. And again, what's really really powerful about higher up checkpoints in any of these kingdoms is that all these moons, like that moon I just got, this moon I'm about to get, Nut. all of them, like you're supposed to do all this platforming and everything to get over to them. Nah, I'm just falling on them and I know where to go into. I always like this, a little bit of a bait strat where I bait those two Goombas to come towards me, throw Cappy the other way, snapping to the, the three stack and then being able to capture two more and two more to get to seven. Now, normally, Goombet here, she wants to, you need to be at eye level with her, so the game wants you to get eight Goombas, but because there's a little bit of a hill right there on the side, you can go up that, and that will allow you to, <laughs> that will allow you to, um, that'll allow you to barely kind of trick her into thinking you're a little taller and uh, get her moon. Right here, stopping into the ground pound, getting myself barely under that Good. moon. In what I call the under boob strat. Getting yourself kind of almost pinned underneath the nut. So I can just throw Cappy into the wall and then that is just snapping you back and forth. Busting open the nut, allowing you to get another moon. Nice triple jump movement right there to get that moon high up in the cave. And then beautiful triple jump into the turnaround, the R cam to center it behind you and then diving right into the pipe. So I'm feeling myself, I'm feeling great about that movement, but then unfortunately we give the time back right here and a little more that I missed one little piece of movement in that first section and that costs me this entire water cycle. I try to do a backup right there that is possible, but it's very, very tight. And instead, I just take damage for it. That's a very, very cool room when you do it right. Unfortunately, we did not. And it was from one tiny mistake. I just tried to jump out of that water, the first part of that room, about a frame too early, and it kind of messed us up. Now up here, what I brought up in the last kingdom in Seaside, how as soon as we go through a load zone, that resets where the bird spawns. So I'm gonna try to get a good like five, six, seven moons here, all while this bird is moving. And I'm gonna try to get to the bus stop on time, the famous Super Mario speedrun bus stop, in time to capture the bird and get its moon. So I need good, relatively clean movement throughout this section. I admittingly, oh, nut. that's a nut. I admittingly do a, definitely a less scary moon route. Normally you would get a different moon as well. Nut. There's so many nut moons in Wooden Kingdom, dude. Um, I would normally, uh, uh, speedrunners would normally get one additional moon in this stretch that I got earlier, uh, the nut that was under the observation deck that I hit as I fell off when I first went up there after Captain Toad. Um, that makes things a little scarier to where you can see I had a little bit of sloppy movement, but because of how I do the route, and I have to wait on the bird anyways, I'm not actually losing time there, but that's definitely something that I want to look into if I were to come back to the category is actually moving that, move, that uh, moon routing around to try and say, okay, I'm risking it for the biscuit. The problem is there is not a great backup for getting this bird moon super quickly uh, if you were to miss it. So you can see right here, get here in time to get up on the railing, take my time, line it up, get that bird. And then super optimally, you would actually jump out over the void right there, get the bird moon, like knocking him out and then diving into the, uh, the moon he spawns in. That's very, very scary, um, but definitely something I could see myself learning at some point. Now, overall, coming in, snagging a few more moons. Wooded 2, just about done. We're just about done here with episode 2 of the speedrun run back. Speedrun watch back, I should say. I need to remember the name of my series, damn it. Always a fun room to go through. 
and a room where I do the movement differently every single time I go through here. It's just kind of whatever I'm feeling, just making sure you're getting through there in a relatively quick manner. Utilizing the bonsai bell right here to slam yourself through that wall and then doing some little bit of fun box movement right here. Blind dive onto that moon. And now we warp away for three more moons before we are done. Going to the same save point I first warped to here in the beginning of Wooded 2 for the post game. Drop it down, getting a timer challenge. Long jumping two times out. Diving out of the second pole right there. Diving directly onto the moon. Long jumping, making sure I line that up correctly. I kind of lost some P-speed movement right there, which also kind of messed up my spacing. Did do a good up warp right there where I ground pounded, and while that moon was spawning in, I grabbed the ledge because the game will then give you the moon and actually warp you up to on top of the ledge. Nice ground pound jump right there to skip out on a lot of the timer challenge going on right there. Back flipping, getting up, and taking our warp painting into sand two. That'll bring us to a, a close for episode two of Speedrun Breakdown. Again, guys, hope you all have been enjoying the series. Again, so sorry the first ep the uh, first upload of this had super loud music and drowned out all my commentary. I feel like I did better commentary today, honestly, than that first attempt of the episode. The next time we're here, we will be completing our watch back of my Super Mario Odyssey Darker Side speedrun in three hours, 19 minutes, and 57 seconds. Uh, we have just a little bit, a little bit over an hour to go, about an hour and six minutes left on the clock. So it'll be a little shorter than here in episode two. Picking it up with Sand 2 and going all the way to the multi-moon at the end of the Darker Side Kingdom. Should be a fun episode to get to watch back through. If y'all are enjoying the speedrun, randomizer, casual playthrough challenge, playthrough content going on here on the channel, make sure you bop that subscribe button below me for the channel. We definitely appreciate it. And uh, come on by the, uh, the Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash Spike Vegeta, to watch a lot of this done live. Should be fun. All right, gamers, have a good night. We'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.